These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. In 1267 BCE, Hattusili III took the throne from his nephew Mershali III, more commonly known by his birth name Urhiteshev. The deposed Mershali's whereabouts are suspected, but not known for sure. The young king vanishes here from history, though he may have remained a rebellious thorn in Hattusili's foot for some time afterwards. Hattusili, meanwhile, is now quite old, easily in his mid-fifties, if not a tad bit older. You may recall that Hattusili was born extremely sickly, and while he has survived far longer than the original prognosis thanks to the blessings of the goddess Ishtar, it seems that all his poor health, plus a youth spent in constant campaigning, is now settling deep into his bones, where his naturally poor constitution is increasingly playing host to malady after malady. We don't have much detail on the matter, since it was naturally a matter of national importance to play down the king's ailments, but with his enthronement, we must keep it in mind, in the background of a king frequently suffering from, and even sometimes incapacitated by, illness of various sorts. Perhaps because of his illness, perhaps because of the decidedly questionable manner in which he took the throne, and perhaps because the Hittite state was fairly well spent by this point after war upon war, Hattusili came to the throne with a very different set of priorities than most Hittite kings. He either has no interest in, or doesn't believe the state has, the capacity to expand its borders. Instead goes on an extended campaign of securing the existing borders via peace treaties with the major powers. This began with the anti-Egyptian alliance that Hattusili secured with Kadashman Turgu of Babylon, in response to Urhi Teshub's adventure to the pharaoh's court, but the Babylonian king died only a year or two later and was replaced by Kadashman Enlil II, who was much less interested in being hostile with Egypt. We looked at how the young Kadashman Enlil was being influenced by his chief advisor in this decision and all the internal Babylonian politics that were disrupting Hattusili's attempts at coalition building, but the end result Whatever the case, was a frustrated king unable to meet his very first goals. But if he was unable to turn friends into allies, he was still able to make some noticeable gains in this initial diplomatic wave. On the eastern border, a Syrian king, Adad Nirari, had taken full and unquestionable control of the Mitanni heartland of Hanagalbat, despite Hittite assistance of the Mitanni rebels. This had been a black mark for the previous king, and had been part of increasingly poor relations between the rising Assyrians and their established Hittite neighbors as the borders began to rub more closely together. While the underlying factors causing the tensions would require significant changes to shift, Hattusili was able to send letters to Adad Nirari pointing out that he was a new king with a new agenda, and proved it by sending a generous helping of diplomatic gifts to Asher. Polite words and nice presents were able to settle the uneasy situation that Uri Teshub had created on this border. While the two sides will remain tense for quite a while, trade could flow freely, and the soldiers could mostly stay in their forts for a little bit longer. While we usually think of diplomacy as a king's relations with other nations, in the ancient world, matters between a king and his vassals were handled in much the same way. And here, Hattusili had some marked success in the matter of internal diplomacy. Most notable, because a great deal of the treaty survives, is the treaty with Benteshina of Amaru, making him a vassal on the Egyptian border. Deposed by Muatali for falling to the Egyptians, reinstated by Uri Teshub, and now fully reconciled by Hattusili. The details are obscure, as is typical, but suggest to us either that Benteshina 
though given power back by Uri Teshub, took some part in the little civil war on Hattusili's side and was rewarded for it, or that he was a powerful Uri Teshub supporter who was given a pardon on account of his personal influence and needed to be bound tightly to the ruling house to keep him in check. Either way, this Minor King story ends happily, with Bentashina being rewarded with a wife from the royal household and his daughter being married to one of Hattusili's many sons. This son, Nerakaili, managed to make it down to Amaru just in time for the wedding, then managed to capture the fugitive Urhi Teshub, then may have died from unknown causes, or just simply botched it so badly that he was completely ashamed. Nerakaili's fate aside, Bendashina appears to have had a happily ever after past this point. With all this in place, Hattusili is able to focus his attention on what he expected would be the make-or-break moment for his kingship, the matter of Egypt and Ramesses. It was clear from the start that Hattusili would need to deal with Egypt, either on the battlefield or through diplomacy. In his very earliest years, it seems he may have been keeping both options on the table. His earliest letters to the pharaoh were conciliatory, much along the lines of the letters he sent to Dadnirari in Assyria, emphasizing that he was a new king in charge in Hattusha. Meanwhile, the attempt at a military alliance against Egypt shows that he was simultaneously hoping to build a coalition to overwhelm the Egyptians. Remember that the Hittites had been badly drained by the sheer scale of the Battle of Kadesh, and likely the subsequent fighting in Mitanni and among themselves had done nothing to rectify the situation. Indeed, Anatolia was often badly depopulated in these periods of time, and though the various wars and fights that they had were able to bring deportees into the heartland to partially repopulate and occupy those empty fields, it'll continue to be a logistical trouble for the empire going forward. As historians, we can see that Egypt was facing a similar military exhaustion, but Hattusili may not have known, or may not have known the extent of, his southern neighbor's military capacity, and thus felt that outside assistance was definitely needed. However, with this assistance not forthcoming, Hattusili was forced to commit to a peace agreement. He definitely needed it. It wasn't simply optional, since there would have been pressure for him, as a usurper, to prove that he could deliver a tangible foreign success after Uri Teshub's disaster against Assyria. A solid, equitable peace treaty with the pharaoh of Egypt, recognizing him as the rightful king of the Hittites, would give him both the win he needed and the legitimacy he may have been lacking. He may not have been able to overwhelm Egypt with that hoped-for Babylonian alliance, but he had pacified the Assyrians for the moment and secured the alliance of the Syrian border princes, putting him in about as good of a position as he could have hoped for. The rest came down to his skill as a diplomat. Fortunately, Ramesses' early expansions had begun to taper off now that he was in his 20th decade on the throne, and the geopolitical situation was looking no more favorable for the pharaoh than it was for the great king. Ramesses also needed a win to present to his people, and Hattusili proved to be a consummate international diplomat with his practical words and fine gifts. And so, in late November of 1259 BCE, and we can date it so precisely because Ramesses kept much better records than the Hittites, Kassites, or Assyrians did, the so-called Eternal Treaty was signed between Egypt and the Hittites. Ramesses was able to tell internal audiences that the great northern power had come crawling to him, begging for an alliance, while Hattusili was able to tell his court that the mighty southern kingdom had recognized him as true and legitimate king of Hatti. Meanwhile, a pair of silver tablets were exchanged, which would be copied and recopied throughout the empires. One was written in Nishili, the Hittite language, and translated into Akkadian, 
then handed to the Egyptians. The other was written in Kemetic, the Egyptian language, and translated into Akkadian, then hand handed to the Hittites. This allowed the two copies of the treaty, despite running through three different languages, from being quietly altered to suit the preferences of the individual kings. And despite being separated by hundreds of miles, copies found in Anatolia and along the Nile are almost identical, aside from a few scribal and translation peculiarities. A fairly remarkable feat for such an important single document. The treaty itself is in many ways extremely conventional, which I think makes it all the more interesting. Here we are in many ways witnessing the pinnacle of the late Bronze Age diplomatic system, with exchanges made in very orderly fashions. In the standardized Akkadian language, to create an almost paint-by-numbers treaty among two major powers. It's concise enough that, aside from the endless repetition of certain phrases, it actually isn't that boring to read, and in certain elements shows enough maturity to operate within the established bounds of the treaty genre to say things that are surprising, novel, and of course diplomatically very useful to both of the sides. It begins by naming the two parties, and a lot of modern folks have a sense of ancient kings as being overburdened by grandiose titles. And while they certainly made sure their names took up a lot of space on the page, we can read this section here to see how great leaders presented themselves to other great leaders, when the pomposity of the full list of claimed titles might actually get in the way of getting something done. Thus says Ramesses, beloved of Ammon, great king, king of Egypt, hero of all lands, son of Seti I, who was also great king, king of Egypt, and hero, as well as grandson of Ramesses I, who was great king, king of Egypt, and hero, to Hattushili, great king, king of Hatti, Hero, son of Mershili, who was great king, king of Hatti, and Hero, and grandson of Shapililiuma, who was a great king, king of Hatti, and Hero. And so it takes quite a bit of time to mention each king, but much of this is repeated praise for the lineage of each king. Note here that it only goes back two generations. Perhaps this is because more would be stylistically excessive, though perhaps also they cut it here because Ramesses is still only the third king of the 19th Egyptian dynasty, the relative newness of which may not have been something the pharaoh is super keen on emphasizing. After the parties are named, we get a little history. This is very typical, especially of Hittite treaties, in which either the good deeds or misdeeds of the two treaty partners are recorded to help contextualize the treaty as a whole. It is, of course, a very useful resource for modern historians, though in this case the two nations insist in this history section that never in all of history from the very beginning of time and forever, have the Hittites and Egyptians ever been in a state of war. Coming 14 years after the Battle of Kadesh, this is obvious nonsense, but it is a very politically useful fiction and enables both sides to neatly sidestep the question of who may have been at fault for the previous incident, and avoid casting one side or the other as more dominant or more virtuous something that could well have bogged down negotiations needlessly. Furthermore, it allows the treaty to slide quite nicely into an eternal declaration of friendship. For just as the two nations have always been at peace, so too are their kings always brothers and always friends. Next, the two kings swear to never attack each other, using much the same formula as the Declaration of Friendship. Then the two sides agree to take it a step further by repeating the same formula to promise to defend each other from attack. Interestingly, this mutual defense agreement includes not just attacks by some external foe, which both sides must surely have had a wary eye on the expanding Assyrians with this, but also, should the, should the kings become angry with their own subjects, by which they mean 
have to put down a revolt, then the other king will support this rebellion, crushing as well. Which reminds us that even though we're calling this a treaty between two nations, it, like all these ancient treaties, are agreements between two men, explicitly designed to preserve their individual power. To put it another way, the king of a nation was the nation, and if his people fought against him, they were no longer Egyptians or Hittites or whatever, but a new separate nationality of a rebel to be fought like any other external foe. Similarly, each king swears to hunt down and extradite any fugitives that cross their mutual border. This is a very standard clause that we see in essentially every Hittite treaty that we have. At the same time, this quite common clause has taken on an increased relevance with the then still ongoing hunt for Uri Teshub. And it isn't clear at all if Ramesses was participating in the hunt for the defeated king before or after this treaty obligated him to. Additionally, this section of the treaty gives us one final glimpse into the story of Bentashina of Amaru, who is singled out for special consideration, being the lord of a border realm. We could see this as an indication of Bentashina's status, for he was required by treaty to pass any Egyptian fugitives back to Egypt, but has no obligations concerning the Hittites, because of course he's already a Hittite vassal, though clearly one large and independent enough to merit his own separate mention in a treaty that otherwise mentions no one but the two kings, their ancestors, and their gods. Clearly, whatever was going on in Amaru, Bentashina is confirmed in the Eternal Treaty as a power player of note. Aside from the one-sided inclusion of Amaru, there is only one other item in the entire treaty which is not laid equally on both kings. A clause in the treaty confirms that after the death of Hattushili, Hattushili's son will take his place on the throne. Now this alone was far from obvious, since there were still sons of Muatali that may have been eligible, and possibly Uri Teshub may by now have had his own valid offspring. Also, it may seem odd to see this confirmed not in domestic law, but in a treaty with a foreign power, until you realize that right after this, Ramesses confirms that if the Hittite people do not accept Hattushili's chosen heir, then Egyptian chariots will ride north in defense of the succession. No such offer is made in the other direction. This is huge and extremely powerful for both sides. For Ramesses, guaranteeing the succession of another king, in effect, makes him the superior king. It isn't exactly vassalage, but suddenly he can quite plausibly claim that the succession of the Hittite throne depends on his support. The greatest rival and threat to Egypt suddenly becomes a dependency, at least when spun that way to domestic audiences, which was unquestionably a huge deal to the politics of the age. At the same time, Hattushili, by the time of this treaty, is at least 60 years old, if not a bit past that. This is an age when men can start expecting to die any day, and Hattushili all the more so for a lifetime spent sick. The deposed Uri Teshub still lived, other sons of Muatali still lived, and surely plenty of other possible contenders for the throne were circling around the unstable throne of a sick old man. Hattushili could not do anything as king, and he could not guarantee continuity for his lineage without a measure of stability. He gained that stability for himself with the great victory that this treaty represented, and the very real threat of an Egyptian intervention likely helped stabilize the prospect of his lineage, calming nobles around the country, whether they may have been fearing another civil war on the king's passing, or if they perhaps had been hoping to get in on the action themselves. But as significant as Hattushili's personal gains are from this treaty, the greatest fallout is the end of the threat from the south for the first time in generations. Though the egypt hatti feud has in fact only very rarely escalated into full-on fighting, 
The devastation of the Battle of Kadesh showed that any full battle between the two powers was unbearably costly. And more to the point, even those years where the two neighbors were not directly attacking each other were mired by a cold war, which deterred trade, distracted the nations from other priorities, and encouraged the Syrian vassals to scheme and plot for advantage between them. This doesn't mean that a century of mutual hostility simply ended. Soon after the treaty was signed, Hattusili wrote a letter complaining about how the Hittite side was being portrayed in certain Battle of Kadesh memorials over in Egypt. Ramesses' response was to tell Hattusili to try and not be a loser next time if he didn't want to be remembered as a loser forever and ever, which was perhaps not very polite of him. But also, Ramesses reiterated that the two kings would be friends forever, and that the alliance between them would last until the end of time. Two powers with a mutual border and significant conflicting interests were perhaps bound to have certain tensions between them. But there can be no doubt that the relations overall between Ramesses and Hattusili improved following this treaty. Letters would be continually exchanged between the two nations, and 13 years after the signing ceremony, Ramesses would marry one of Hattusili's daughters to further cement the bond between the two nations. And even if this wedding was accompanied by no small amount of bickering itself, it seems that the wedding had to be delayed at a certain point because some sort of royal warehouse or treasury in Hattusha was burned down taking with it much of the new bride's dowry on the eve of the wedding. Ramesses was not a patient man, but he was more than happy to accept the many gifts the new bride brought with her, representing the whole thing as the act of a subject nation bringing tribute to the god king of the Nile, with all the humility and grace that the great pharaoh is known for. The full course of Hittite-Egyptian diplomacy through the end of the Bronze Age is mostly peaceful, full of small incidents, but nothing that comes to upset the peace treaty. Indeed, the so-called Eternal Treaty will turn out to last until the collapse of the Hittite Empire, and will come to preserve a treasure trove of royal correspondence. For example, Hattusili at one point sends a letter to Ramesses asking for an Egyptian doctor, explaining that he needs a fertility specialist to help one of his daughters, who has married the king of the Seha Riverlands, and they would like to conceive a child. Ramesses is openly derisive of this in his reply, for it seems that Hattusili's daughter is at this point some 50 or 60 years old. Yet, he not only complies, but sends a whole team of medical, magical, and religious experts to give her the best shot she can possibly have at conceiving. Which turns out to be not actually all that great, but that's how it goes. In another letter, Ramesses wants very much to meet with Hattusili, probably because he wants to have a big international party, and even condescends to travel to the border so that they can each meet each other halfway. In this instance, despite his pleading, the pharaoh is unable to get what he wants, for it seems Hattusili is at some times suffering from a disease which swells his feet and thus can't walk, and other times engaged in the pressing matters at other parts of the empire. But we can't pass over this diplomacy without mentioning the outsized role played in all of this by Queen Putahepa. Only 15 years old, when she met the already aged Hattusili after the Battle of Kadesh, she had spent her whole life as a priestess of Ishtar, and the daughter of two other priests, and so had likely been trained in reading, writing, theology, and diplomacy, at least to a certain extent, before her sudden wedding to the man who would later be king. This training would serve her well, as the couple seemed to be exceedingly close, both deeply in love with each other and deeply respectful of the other's abilities as rulers. The seal of Putuhepa often accompanies her husband in official correspondence and governing decrees, and there are a good number of both, written in the Queen's name, in which she is taking care of state business on her husband's behalf.
She personally sent at least 15 letters to Ramesses and his court on fairly weighty topics such as royal matchmaking and wedding preparations, which helped to reinforce the alliance with Egypt. So high was her standing, in fact, that as the fellow great kings called each other brother, Ramesses, in the many letters he sent directly back to Putuhepa, referred to her as sister. She was not just handling diplomacy with other nations, though. The main job of Tawanana, or Hittite High Queen, was always religious, and she turned her skilled stylist towards the gods themselves. We could see in these prayers part of the reason why she was so often called upon to assist in secular government, for she was continuously praying for her husband's health in the face of an eye disease, a foot disease that involved swelling and intense pain, and other illnesses that seemed to plague Hattusili for his entire 30-year reign, indeed his entire perhaps 80-year life. But she wasn't just praying for his wellness. The former priestess composed new religious hymns and forged new religious understandings. In many ways, she bears a striking resemblance to that other priestess of Ishtar a thousand years previously, the world's oldest known author, Enheduanna, daughter of Sargon of Akkad. Much like that previous royal lady, Putuhepa composed prayers of striking beauty and passion to Ishtar and all the other divinities of the Hittite pantheon, and she also stood at the forefront of a move to rework the Hittite understanding of religion altogether. Up until this point, the Hittite empire had prided itself on being the land of a thousand gods. If anything, that poetic moniker likely understates the situation, perhaps as much as an order of magnitude. The Hittites had gods for everything. Every lake, mountain, and river had a god. Inanimate objects were personified into gods. The natural order was divided into gods for storms and sun and birth and crops and all manner of things like that. And up to this point, we're really describing more or less every Bronze Age religion we have records for. Where the Hittites get distinctive is that for most of their history, they engaged in essentially no synchronization at all. When they conquered new communities of people and found that they too worshipped a storm god that was quite all similar to the one already venerated in Hattusha, whereas another king might take these two very similar gods and say, oh, you're worshipping the same god we've always worshipped. But instead, no matter how similar these two separate gods seemed, the Hittites would take them as two completely separate gods, to be maintained and worshipped independently of each other, leading to a situation where there were dozens of nearly identical gods, each distinguished only by the geographical label of where it originated from. Now, in the late Bronze Age, there was definitely something in the air theologically leading to a number of changes, both large and small, in religious practice. Perhaps the earliest is Egypt's failed henotheist experiment, venerating the sun disk Aten under Akhenaten. We've seen how this whole period saw a rise in prominence of the chief city gods of Marduk and Asher over in Mesopotamia. And of course, there's quite a lot that has been written about a certain Habiru tribe just now starting to form a cohesive self-identity that involves the worship of a certain Yahweh. In the Hittite sphere, Putuhepa carried the torch of religious modernization by radically trimming the Tree of Faith, syncretizing all the top gods down to a manageable handful. From dozens of regional storm gods, there was now just the one, typically one closely identified with Hurrian traits, so the royal storm god becomes identified concretely with the Hurrian god Teshub, while the sun goddess becomes identified with Hepat, who isn't actually a sun goddess at all, but is the consort of the chief god, much like the old Hattian sun goddess was, and so the two get squished together, 
As we see, this process was not always smooth. No synchronization ever lines gods up perfectly one for one, which was probably why the Hittites never did it in the past. As even the dozens of regional Ishtars had acquired slightly different traits and rituals over time, though we know, of course, that they all came from the same place down in Sumer. Politically, the divine diversity had long served a valuable function within the empire, allowing a radically diverse group of cultures and kingdoms to be governed and loosely integrated into the Hittite order, without anyone feeling that their faith was being disrespected. Now that the empire had stopped expanding and Hattusili needed to establish his central authority, Reducing this plurality and generating a distinctive Hittite pantheon may have had the political effect of slowly unifying the culture and traditions of all these distinct and often restive groups. However, we should resist the cynical temptation to purely politicize this move. Thanks to the static worldview of the late Bronze Age Middle Easterners, the Queen may have had no idea that such a convenient cultural shift was even possible to engineer. Additionally, both Putahepa and Hattushili are deeply pious individuals, for whom their devotion to Ishtar in particular, and the gods in general, played a large role in their formative childhood experiences, as well as a big part of their duties as King and Queen. They may have sponsored this religious shift solely out of an earnest desire to do right by the gods. But even taking that into account, there may have been one practical benefit to this king from the regularization of worship. By the late Hittite period, the king was expected to per be personally present at between 100 and 200 religious rituals every single year, many of which were scattered around the empire as far south as Kizawatna and as far north as Narek by the Kaskan territory. While sending authorized substitute was allowed, it was recognized by both priests and kings that this was a subpar compromise. And even the process of appropriately consecrating a substitute, who had to be a person of suitable importance, took a bit of time out of the busy royal schedule. With Hattushili's frequent illnesses and inability to travel, it's speculated, though not at all certain, that reducing the personal burden on the king was at least a minor goal in all of this. After all, why go to ten different festivals in ten different locations to ten different storm gods when Hattushili could in fact just sacrifice to Teshub in the capital and achieve the same effect? Sadly, we know very little concretely about the theological motivations for this shift. We don't even know how broad-based it is, leading some to suspect that Putahepa may have invented it purely from her personal piety and imposed it on a largely resistant nation. I suspect that, given the other theological changes in the region, there may have been a religious faction for whom Queen Putahepa represented an important and intelligent figurehead. Whether this group was large or small is unknowable, but Queen Putahepa's role in the matter is unquestionable. For her entire exceedingly long life, she, remember, married at age 15 and may have lived to age 90, we see her hand pushing towards synchronization. We will see this accompanied by a massive campaign of temple reconstruction, as well as new literary output, some by the queen herself, of novel and heartfelt hymns and prayers to the gods. These were fantastically expensive, but the Hittite Empire is at its height and enjoying a final flourishing of peace and prosperity, and it likely seemed quite appropriate to share this bounty with the gods who made it all possible. Where we generally do not see this synchronization, however, is in the more local worship of average Hittite subjects. The nature of our sources make it impossible to know what the average person thought of the Queen's new revelations. Perhaps it was opposed as an unnecessary new innovation and resisted at the local level.
Equally possible is that it was welcomed, but that it was an extensive process to properly understand and unite the scattered aspects of the Thousand Gods, and attention naturally focused on the highest royal and international gods first. Equally possible is that this, like many religious details, was left wholly to the elites, and the common worshipper may have had little idea that a religious revolution was taking place at all. Whatever the case, such an undertaking is the sort of thing that would have required centuries to fully pan out. Centuries that the Hittite civilization simply doesn't have left. Thus, the religious legacy of Pudahepa, while fascinating and revolutionary, would never fully pan out, and remains as one of the more interesting, unfilled potentials of the Bronze Age. The reign of Hattusili III, with its peace on the major borders and legacy of centuries of rising Hittite power, is the final peak of the Hittite Empire. Soon, the climate will shift, both ecologically and societally, and out in distant parts of the world, there are already dynamics at play that will domino out to topple the mighty Anatolian Empire. But for those living in these times, they likely seem to be about as good as the Bronze Age ever got, both for the wealthy and the common man. There's still more of the Hittite story left to tell, but as we transition from peak to fall, despite the earnest efforts of the last few kings, there must surely have been someone wondering if all these religious reforms had not brought the wrath of the gods down upon the land of Hatti. So join us next time as we see old threats transitioning into new ones. Thank you for listening.